Hi all, good afternoon. Uh, this is Pramod. I would be your CFP faculty for the um, most of the modules except for the taxation. To have a quick introduction about myself, uh, I am a certified financial planner. I cleared my CFP way back in 2007 and I have been practicing financial planning. I am also registered with SEBI as an investment advisor. And uh, today this session is primarily to introduce you to the concept of financial planning and also let you know how this entire uh, structure of CFP curriculum has been made by FPSB, the authority who is giving the license of CFP in India. Right? So I believe you all can uh, see my presentation. Now, what is financial planning? Now, before getting to the concept of financial planning, if you see the way the personal finance landscape is changing in India for the past maybe uh, two, three decades, it's been phenomenal, right? So there was a time when people used to work in government jobs and they know that, you know, when I get into a job, I'm going to retire after 20, 30 years. They are also clear that I am going to make some kind of a pension and they know what kind of retirement benefits they get. But if you see the last 20 years, there is more and more private jobs coming in, a lot of privatization. And today, most of our uh, value addition or GDP you call is happening in the private sector. And a lot of employment opportunities are also created in the private sector. And the moment you look at the private sector, there is not much of retirement benefits that is being given. And there is a lot of uncertainty with respect to the employment opportunities also when you are looking at uh, private sector, right? So there is no guarantee that you are going to uh, work with the same employer for maybe next 20, 25 years. There is no guarantee that you would not be laid off. There is no kind of retirement benefits given. Maybe there can be some kind of a provident fund and stuff like that. But there is no guarantee of any kind of a benefits of pensions that you can expect from them, right? With this kind of uncertainty, it has become much more clearer for people that we need some kind of a guidance for financial planning to manage our own finances. So when you look at this word financial planning, we need to understand that uh, this is about personal finance. So I'm sure some of you may be uh, people who are pursuing different certifications like maybe, you know, or CA or maybe, you know, some of you may be commerce graduates or some of you may be doing your post graduation. When we look at financial planning here, we are talking of personal financial planning. I think that difference, we need to be very clear about it. It is not about corporate finance. Right? And when we look at personal finance, we need to understand there is a huge space here which is not addressed appropriately. And that's the reason the need for financial planning has enhanced over a period of time. Right? Now, simultaneously, we also need to understand how, how is the literacy levels of individuals with respect to this area of personal finance. There have been various surveys done across the globe and India ranks very, very low with less than around 20% financial literacy. And this financial literacy is done looking at people who can understand the concepts of compounding, understand the concepts with respect to the basic financial uh, you know, literacy, right? And we score very, very poor. And the best of the countries, the developed countries is having a score of somewhere around 50, 55%. They are not doing great there, but at least somewhere around 55, 60. And we are somewhere close to uh, 20%, right? Which means today we are having people who are not well versed in making decisions who are earning handsome salaries but they are not appropriately guided now this is where this particular profession of being a financial planner creates a lot of opportunities for people right now let us go see what is financial plan now when individuals make money right we are always in the present right we know that currently i am making so much of income i know this is the kind of spending i am having and i know that I have a family to take care of, I have my loans to pay, I have something to achieve in the future, I have to retire at some point of time. But when you put all of this together, we need to have a plan which can be implemented and executed, which can help us achieve all these targets. Now that's what the financial planning is all about, right? So as you can see on the slide, right, it's a holistic approach, which means we are not talking of only one piece of information. Now, when you look at the market today, when you go to any bank, right, the banks are supposed to be into the banking, but banks are also doing a lot of product selling. They sell insurance, they sell mutual fund, they sell gold, they sell all kinds of various other offerings, right? So when you walk into a bank as a lay customer and then ask them, this is what I want to do, maybe the person sitting on the other side of the desk doesn't understand your requirements. Now that leads to a lot of uh, 
mis-selling you know, because they don't understand what you want and most of the cases you yourself don't know what is that you are looking at. With this kind of a context, right, the financial planning brings a holistic approach to that wherein we are telling it is about managing an individual's resources. Right? So when we say resources, we need to understand the resources are spread over a timeline. Like today, maybe you are in 2024. So maybe in March 2024, I am getting an income of so much. But going forward, I'm going to have an increment in salary. I'm going to have promotions. I may be looking at better job opportunities, right? Maybe, you know, my spouse may start working. So there are so many opportunities of generating higher incomes, right? On simultaneously, there is a downside also. Maybe that, you know, my spouse will stop working at some point in time, right? My expenses are going to increase. So there is going to be resources coming and going at various points of time in our life. So when we look at financial planning, so we are talking about having a holistic approach which deals with all these aspects of your cash flows, which helps in achieving your goals in the future, considering all the resources, right? So developing a plan to help individuals achieve their financial goals with available financial sources. And when we say available, it is not only present, but also the future available resources. So that's something which to understand. Now with understanding what is financial planning, now the second step is how do we go about doing the financial planning? Now, this job is not going to be an easy one because if you see today as on date, there are hardly 2000 uh, and odd financial planners certified in the Indian market, certified by FPSB who are carrying the tag certified financial planner. Now we are talking of a country of 1.4 billion people and we are also talking of a very young uh, population, working population, but still we are not having adequate number of people to deliver the financial planning and proper advice to the clients, right? So now let us go and see how to do the financial planning. Now the moment you look at financial planning, right? We need to understand any kind of a service or any kind of a offering should have an appropriate process to follow, right? Unless the process is structured, you cannot have a outcome which can be guaranteed with quality. Now in this context, FPSB has created a six step process which is internationally uh, acclaimed which is called a financial planning process, a six step process. And what does this process include? You can see from the picture, it starts with establishing the relationship, establish and define the relationship with the client. Now, when you start your engagement with the client, we need to understand that the requirement of the client may be different from what you have done to some other client. Every client has a different requirement. Generically, they may be same, but specifically they are different. Right? So we need to understand when you are defining your relationship with the client, you need to understand what is that the client is expecting from you and can you deliver that. Now there will be some times that some part of the service may not be delivered by us, but we can always refer to somebody else. Right. So when we are getting into the relationship, engagement of this relationship, we need to tell the clients clearly, this is what you can expect from me. This is what I can deliver for you. Right. And maybe, you know, if there is any terms with respect to the fees and the standard setting, right, we need to have all this consensus built in the uh, letter of engagement or some kind of an agreement which is made with the client in the initial process, right. So that's what establishing the relationship is. Now, it may look very easy that establishing the relationship is the most easiest part. But believe me, out of all the six steps, the most difficult step, if you ask me from my personal experience, is establishing the client relationship. Because when we talk about a client, we are talking about individual. Individual is an emotional person, right? You need to connect with the individual emotionally so that he can start sharing what he wants. And it is not easy for people to talk about money and more so with Indian context. I have had clients where I had to meet them three times, four times, just to make them open up their minds and start seeking what they want. Because there is a lot of hesitation for people to talk about the kind of income they make, the kind of assets they are holding, you know, the kind of investments they are making, right? And the kind of family requirements they have. So it's not easy to open up to a stranger. So you need to warm up to that and that is where establishing the relationship comes in. And in this particular point, we need to have very good interpersonal skills, right? So your ability to connect with the client, your ability to communicate, your ability to empathize with the client. All these aspects becomes very critical when you are talking of building a relationship with the client, right? And unless you have built a proper relationship with the client, you cannot think of going to the next step. And how do you know that my client, I am 
adequately uh, confident that he will start sharing the details because if you look at the second step it's collecting the client's information now your first step ends and the second step starts so when you are looking at collecting the client information the client will start giving you information only when he feels confident that he you can deliver your promises and the client is also confident that his data is safe he can open up safely with you now that's where the relationship building will take off to the data collection now if you do not have appropriate uh, relationship with the client and if you just try to go and give some kind of a questionnaire to the client asking him to fill up the data collection questionnaire he would be very cold he would not even fill up just imagine that you know somebody comes to you when you are drawing money from an atm somebody comes to you and says uh, see can you please tell me what is your income or you know what is the rent you are paying would you just open up to a stranger just like that you don't open up right because you will want to know who is the person who i am talking to what is the relevance of this information and what is the implication of the data i am sharing what will he put it across for right and i have had people who asked me that pramod are you from income tax department you know because you know they are worried that you know i don't want to talk up, talk to a person who looks very serious you know who is somebody who may be you no know, coming around as a in disguise you know who may be a it department guy so people have all these queries so we need to cross that barrier of establishing the relationship and then go to the second step of collecting the data right now there are multiple ways of collecting data now when you talk of collecting data you may have a questionnaire you may have some kind of an online mechanism where you have a document available where the client can log into that and then start updating data so you can use any of them it can be a manually filled physical paper also and um, i mean it may look very old but you know still there may be people who want to have physically filling up the documents they want to do it at leisure right so it can be any of these things but the main objective is what is the kind of data we are collecting not how we are collecting how we are collecting is a matter of convenience but what we are collecting is what is material to our financial planning right so when you look at the kind of data that needs to be collected the first point we need to look at is quantitative data which is most easy to collect quantitative is numbers right so when you are talking to client and asking him about what is his uh, name what is his age or what is his date of birth what is the kind of salary he is having what is his family size what is the kind of employment opportunities he is presently dealing with you know is he having an idea of when to want to retire There's so many aspects with respect to that right you can collect all this and it is easy for the client to give this data because they are numbers they are data which is easily putable right so we are talking of quantitative now there is another aspect which is called qualitative now qualitative collecting the data which is of qualitative in nature is very very difficult you know you can't ask a person how healthy are you right you can't ask a person how much is your risk appetite or how much risk can you take with respect to your investments because the client cannot open up and say you know pramod i can take 100 units of uh, risk or 50 units of risk so there is no way of quantifying that so this is where lot of qualitative information has to be taken right now this is more sensitive there are different tools available you will also develop some of them with your experience you know how to build the conversations and make people come out with quantitative and qualitative information now collecting information in itself is a challenge because most of the times the clients may not be very organized you know i have had clients where i saw that they have made some investments 15 years back 20 years back they have no clue about it they have lost everything except that they have made an investment they have no other proof of that and times long right and today people keep moving you know their jobs keeps taking them to places and when they keep moving from point a to point b they change the bank account they change the address they change everything and the investment they made 10 15 years back is somewhere lost and when you start doing the data collection i also found lot of people will come up with all this information and then you also end up helping them to figure out all this old you know data that is lying with them right and once you do the data collection we also try to understand in the process of data collection what are the kind of goals the client is looking at what are the kind of goals the client wants to achieve right the client goals can be something like i want to buy a house i want to buy a car i want to have a holiday home i want to go on a foreign trip you know i want to plan for my child education i want to plan for my child marriage any of these things now most of the goals are a little bit away on the timeline when we say timeline we are telling maybe 3 months 6 months 9 months 12 months 20 years 30 years right 
Now, a short-term goal may be less than a year when he says, Pramod, I want to you know, look at down payment for my car or I want to look at buying a phone or something like that. You know, wherein he is planning for 50,000, 1 lakh, whatever the amount he is looking at. And the longest goal can be his retirement when he says, I want to plan for my retirement maybe you know, 25 years from now. Maybe you know, 49, 50, 20, 49, 20, 50, I want to retire. Now, here we are talking of the data collection and also goal setting. Goal setting is part of that. And once you do that, then you get into analyzing the client's financial status. Now that you got adequate amount of data, right? Now you should see the process. Okay, first you build the relationship, you take the client to the confidence. And once the client has confidence in you, that is when you start asking him for data. If the client has no confidence, you may keep you hanging upside down, the client is not going to give any kind of a data to you. Right? So once you cross the level one, you go to the level two, you collect data from the client, right? And then we spoke about qualitative and quantitative. The data that you collected, that is going to be analyzed, subject to a lot of calculations and analysis, right? Now, what are the kind of calculations and analysis we do? That is what we will learn in different modules, right? And once you do this analysis, that is when you start looking at recommending. So that's your developing the financial plan. So if you look at the fourth step, develop the financial planning recommendations and present it to the client. Now, this is where we are talking of, I do the data analysis, I make some kind of a strategies, I give those recommendations to the client and I present the plan to the client. Now, this is where the most important part is. This is where the uh, final picture of the financial plan starts developing it. And you make that plan, taking all the data of the client after putting it through all the analysis, right? And does it end there? Once you finish your recommendation and once your financial plan is done, do you think it is going to stop there? No. Just the recommendation is made. If the recommendation made is like reading the recipe of some kind of a you know dish. You read the recipe of a dish, it's not going to satisfy your taste buds or you know, hunger, right? It's just a recipe. So your recommendations you make here is just a recipe for him. When will it be fruitful? Only when you start implementing, it becomes fruitful, right? Now, that is your next step where you help the client with implementation. Now, implementation may be possible that you do some of them yourselves and some of them, because in the Indian context, there are a lot of uh, legal requirements for uh, de delivering some of these products. So, maybe you may not be in a position to do some of them or maybe you may be in a position to do some of them according to you know, your uh, situation at that point in time. So you can help the client to implement some of them and wherever you are not in a position to help the implementation, you refer them to other people, right? Let us say you are telling a client you need to have so much of insurance cover and you are not in a position to give that insurance products to him. You recommend him to go and buy an appropriate product from the market. You want the client to buy some kind of a retirement product or make a retirement investment. So you can advise him, if you are doing it yourself, you can implement it. If you can't, you are going to recommend him, you can go and do somewhere else. And with the technology, so much friendly with people today, you can go and buy a lot of things online also. Just to ensure that you are not falling to some kind of miscommunication suddenly happening somewhere. You can decide what you be, what you need to buy from the recommendations and you can go out and scout for best products in the market. Right? And once the implementation is done, it's not the end. Then comes your last step when we talk about monitoring and reviewing the plan. Now, this is one of the most critical steps because when you talk about financial plan, it's going to be a very, very long time frame, right? So if you look at a client who is around 30 years of age and uh, you are talking of doing a financial plan for him, then the kind of time frame we are looking at makes maybe 55, 60 years. Now, why 55, 60 years? Because today the life expectancy in India you know, the average is somewhere around 76 to 77, but that is an average. So if you want to take a number which is around 85, we are telling the client is today 30, living till maybe 85. So we are talking about 55 years. Now, 55 years is a very long time. And none of us are blessed with our ability to predict how the, you know, the evolution of things are going to be into the next, you know, 45, 50, 55 years. So we need to keep tracking what we did. We need to keep tracking the client's requirements and changes because there can be changes happening at the client front also. Today, the client may have a family which is smaller and later maybe there are new members coming to the family, new goals adding to the family or some of the goals he wants to upgrade them, some of the goals he wants to downgrade them, right? So you need to review them. The 
financial and the aspects are related with respect to the client. Simultaneously, you also need to review the recommendations that have already been implemented or the things that we implemented still making valid sense for us. Do we need to do any changes? Do we need to do any kind of a course correction? So we need to do that and then review and then make any required changes to the client. Right? Now this entire process is what is called a financial planning process and what we saw just now is the financial planning process as structured by FPSB. Now in the part of the financial planning, I don't know if there are any queries. So in the financial planning, you have any queries? Right, no. So in the financial planning, if we are looking at, there are various topics which we end up covering, right? So you can see, I have, you can see the presentation. So multiple things like risk management, right? We are talking of investment planning, retirement planning, tax planning and estate planning. These are all different aspects with respect to an individual's personal finance that is going to be dealt with, right? So we are talking of somebody's retirement. We are talking of somebody's goals being made, met through investment planning. We are looking at estate planning. What if something happens to the client, how the assets would be passed on to the beneficiaries, right? We are also looking at risk management. So we will look at risk management slightly by end of the session. We will just have an introduction. Now, all these aspects are going to be part of your financial plan. Now, these aspects have been covered by CFP curriculum and the structure of the CFP curriculum has been made so that all these things are covered here. So you can see here, the first one you can see as an investment planning specialist. So this is one module which deals completely with investment planning. Now, what are the various aspects that is covered in investment planning? So it talks about investments, risk, return, goal setting, calculations, you know, building a portfolio, optimization of the portfolio, right? And all these aspects with respect to the investment, different types of products available in the market, stocks, mutual funds, evaluating the funds, right? All of them which comes in there. And then you have retirement and tax planning. So in the previous slide, we saw both of them separately because I put them functionally separate. But when you look at the curriculum here, the retirement and tax planning is clubbed into one. So there will be one, one paper which will be dealing with retirement planning and tax planning. Wherein in the retirement planning, we talk about how to plan for an individual's retirement. What are the kind of products that is available? What are the kind of calculations that go into the retirement planning? Right? What is the kind of retirement corpus a client needs to have when he wants to retire? Now today, in the current scenario, a lot of people have crazy ideas. You know, I want to retire by 40. I want to retire by 35. Right? So people are talking of financially independent and retire early. Right? The concept of FIRE. Now people have this anticipation that I can do that, but to get it done thoroughly, a little bit foolproof, we need to have proper expertise there. And that is given here. And also tax planning. And we need to understand when we are dealing with tax planning here, we are looking at tax planning to an extent of what is relevant for personal finance. We are not getting into the tax planning completely like what maybe a child accountant or somebody else is getting into. So here our tax planning is limited to the personal finance products and you know tax filing, basic aspects of the personal finance, right? And then the third paper is about risk and estate planning specialist. So wherein here we talk about risk. Now this risk is different from the investment risk. Now here the moment we say risk, we are talking about insurance, we are talking about risk management mechanisms, identifying the different types of risks, right? What are the different kind of strategies that are available for managing the risk? So there is a wide spectrum of risk management related topics that is covered here. And then you also have estate planning. As I said, estate planning is about passing on your assets to the next generation after you are not there or to the beneficiaries at a later point of time. And then once you clear these three modules, then you are eligible for writing the last module, which is the integrated financial planning. Now that is a bringing together of all the learnings, what you have done in all the other modules. You bring in all these modules together. So in that particular uh, final module, you will have a case study where you will have to write a financial plan, construct a financial plan, and you will also have an exam with respect to that. So once you clear that, I think your examination part of CFP is more or less done and taken care of, right? So I thought first we will have a quick introduction on the entire CFP curriculum and what is financial planning before we start looking into 
more detailed discussion. So I thought I will take you through this. Then I would like to just look at the first module, which we would be starting as risk management. Okay, so in the risk management, we have risk management and estate planning as one paper, but these are two distinct uh, modules. Okay, in the same paper, you have two different modules coming in. Now we are going to start looking at understanding what risk management is all about and what is risk. Now, if you look at this particular context, you know, there are, I would like to share. Yes, so let, let us come back. Okay, let us look at, when we look at risk management here, what is the risk we are looking at? Now, what is risk? Risk means uncertainty. That is something which we all agree upon. But are all risks similar? We are more prone to, more exposed to the concept of something called a speculative risk. Right? There is a possibility, there is a risk that today it may rain. There is a risk that the bus may not be available or the train may not be coming in time. Right? These are all risks, these are uncertainties. Typically, we use the word risk very closely with uncertainties. But when you look at it technically, you know, we end up looking at risk as something called a pure risk and something called as a speculative risk. Now, I would like to look at what is speculative risk first before coming to the pure risk. Now, when you look at speculative risk, we are talking of a possibility of gain or loss. Like let us say you are going and betting on something, right? Or you are playing a lottery. So there is a gain, there is a loss. The loss is that, you know, you may not recover your ticket price. The gain is if you win, you may make a huge amount of money, right? There is a possibility of a gain. There is also a possibility of a loss. And most of the investments by nature have some kind of a speculation element to that because there is a gain element also attached to that. But if you look at pure risk, the pure risk is a possibility of a combination of loss or no loss. Now, when you look at a combination of loss or no loss, can you think of some examples when we can talk about loss and no loss? One of the examples we can look at is that the, there is a possibility of an accident happening and there is a possibility of no accident happening. Let us say I am driving a bike or I am driving a car. So when I am driving a car, there is a possibility that an accident may happen. And if the accident doesn't happen, the ride is going to be smooth. The drive is going to be smooth. So these are the only two possibilities. Can there be a positive possibility that my drive is going to be extraordinary or my car is going to suddenly perform extraordinary well and I can go from point A to point B in amazing speeds and safely? No, it is going to be one of these two. There is an accident, there is no accident. Similarly, somebody is either alive or dead. Somebody is either healthy or he is sick. Now, when you look at pure risk, these are the only two outcomes that you can expect. Now, most of the risk management we are talking here is with respect to the pure risk, wherein the possibility is of a loss and no loss. Now, let us understand when there is no loss, it is a status quo, right? When there is no loss, it is a status quo. I drive a car, so which is maybe worth X amount of rupees. I am using it to come, to go, to travel in the city, to go long drive, everything. And if everything is going fine, all that I need to do is renew my car insurance, buy my petrol and diesel and then just keep using the car. But imagine there is an accident. Now, zero was no accident. Everything was fine. Accident is the loss. Now, once there is a loss, now I have to bring my car back to the routine, right? I have to get it repaired. I have to get it addressed so that it is brought back to the road so that I can use it. So from the loss, I need to recover the losses and bring it back to a utility value. Now that is what we are talking of as a risk management. Loss, no loss. Whenever there is a loss, I want to recover the losses and I am not looking at making a profit out of that. I am trying to recover the losses. That's it. If I have a loss of let us say 50,000 rupees with the accident, I want to recover that 50,000 rupees. I cannot make a profit out of it. I can't say that I want to make 1 lakh rupees out of it. The moment it becomes profitable, it is not pure risk and no insurance company would be interested in that because then there is an incentive for people to make losses. There is an incentive for you to have accidents because when I can make an accident and claim, you know, I have a damage of 50,000 and imagine I can get a claim for a lakh of rupees. So I am making 100% profit, you know, get into an accident, make a claim of 1 lakh, 50,000 for expenses, 50,000 you book the profits. That is not possible in a pure loss. Because they will only cover you to make good for that particular losses. Right? Now, when we look about risk, there are two aspects with risk. As I said, risk is uncertainty and 
whether the risk will happen or not is one aspect of it right like let us say that you may have a car which you are using for last 10 years and touch wood nothing happened to it there was no accident you have been buying insurance policy you have been renewing the policy but no accident happened so the question of whether the risk will happen we don't know it may happen it may not happen right but there is always the more important question when the risk will happen that is why we are afraid of we don't know when it will happen if you know that then obviously you would not take the policy right let us say that we all know that we are going to live for 85 years as we know the date of birth let us say we also get an expiry date right in that case nobody will buy life insurance right because they know i am going to live for next you know 70 years 80 years so no, they will not buy life insurance but the point is you know death is certain people will die but you don't know when that will happen now because you want to protect your family you want to protect your liabilities and all other things you want to ensure that this financial burden doesn't fall on the family you want to buy insurance right so when you are looking at buying insurance what you are doing is you are trying to address the risk of not knowing when it will happen death will happen but i don't know when it will happen if it is happening when i am 85 i don't need insurance if i am guaranteed that i will live till 85 i may not need insurance but because i don't know i want insurance right because life and death is again binary zero and one loss and no loss right now when we look at the risk there are some terminologies which we need to understand the first one is called peril now what is a peril now some of these are technical terms we can't use it casually a peril is the cause of loss now when there is a event happening which is leading to the losses the cause of that event or the cause of the loss is called as a peril now when you go for buying insurance all insurances will not cover all the risks right see we need to understand the insurance company is into risk man you know risk uh, transfer or taking up the risk right so when they are taking up the risk from the individuals they will not take all the kind of risks they will also evaluate whether it is worth taking or not if it is worth taking yes i take up the risk if it is not worth taking i would reject i would say my friend i can't cover you for this please go back and come some other time so that's possible right so here perils all the perils whether they are covered or not depends on what kind of a policy we are taking now we can see some of the examples like fire, you know, fire insurance, right? Earthquake, theft, burglary. Some of these things are all perils which can lead to the losses which are covered by the insurance policies. So when you buy a policy, you should understand whether these perils are covered or not, right? So that will be in the details of the policy documents which you will come across. Now peril is fine, but there is something called hazard, right? Now what is a hazard? Hazard is something which can enhance the probability of the loss happening, right? Now, peril is what causes the loss. Hazard is something which can create the probability of that event happening or enhancing the losses. So, hazard is something which can enhance the losses or enhance the probability of losses. So, let us look at an example, okay? We can look at three types of hazards as a classification, physical hazard, moral hazard and moral hazard. Now, when we look at a physical hazard, you are using a car which is 50 years old, which is not well maintained. Now, the possibility that this car may not function properly, the possibility that there can be a loss or somebody driving this car may meet with an accident and die is much, much higher. Because there is a physical hazard, the, 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 the equipment you are using, the car you are using is not physically fit enough. So, there is a physical hazard associated with that. There have been accidents where people carry uh, inflammable substances in public transport, right? Now, that is a physical hazard. You are carrying a physical inflammable substance into a bus and then you are traveling in a public transport. Now, because you are carrying an inflammable substance, the chances of an event happening is higher and if at all the event happenings, the losses that can happen is also very high. Now, that is a physical hazard. The nature of the hazard is very much physical in nature, right? Now, we need to understand, peril causes the loss, hazard enhances the probability or the intensity of the loss. And then you can have something called moral hazard. Now, what is moral hazard? Now, somebody who is not doing what he is supposed to do, you are supposed to uh, wear a seat belt, you are supposed to wear a helmet, you are supposed to you know, uh, service your car or service your bike 
periodically so that they are functioning fine. If you don't do that, you are morally doing something wrong, right? You are morally doing something wrong and that can lead to some kind of uh, losses and those losses are moral in nature, right? Like drunk and driving. If you are driving normally, the possibility of an accident is less. You know you should not be driving if you are under the influence of any kind of substances, right? But if you still do that, you are morally wrong and that can increase the chances of an accident happening and then also the losses that is coming out of that. That's a moral hazard. And then the final one is moral hazard. Now this looks spelling wise very close to moral hazard. Now what is moral? Now this is a, this is a word which you can maybe, you know, hear in sports, right? Now we saw recently there was a cricket match where, you know, we lost the first test match. Now, the moment you lose the first test match, then maybe, you know, you are morally slow. You are feeling very low that, you know, are we in a position to come back? You know, can we fight it out? Can we make it, right? So, you are low on morale. Now, when you are low on morale, you are not confident. You have given up on something, right? Now, this can by itself lead to losses. Now, how does it happen? Let us say that, you know, there is a fire in the property, right? Now, what is that you are supposed to do? You are, you are supposed to do something which can reduce the losses, reduce the spread of fire. Now, when you are trying to do this, you are doing a good job. But if you have given up already, now that the fire has come already, let the losses be. I can't stop it. No, I know the fire engine cannot make in the traffic. Right. So you give up very early and then you say that, no, I, I the losses are there. Now, what can I do now? Now, that is a moral hazard because you are not doing anything to reduce the losses and you are very low on the moral that indirectly creates the chances of losses. Right? Because you are low on morale, you are giving up on things. Right? So these are the hazards, different types of hazards. Now, why are these things important? When we look at risk, we look at uh, insurance, the insurance companies wants to understand what kind of perils are to be covered and what are they willing to cover. And the insurance companies also put some clauses when you give you an insurance policy. They will tell you. Like if you have a property insurance, let us say you are having, you are living in an apartment complex and you want to insure your apartment complex. Now, when you go to the insurance company, the first thing insurance company will ask is the details of the property, the structure, the quality of the construction. Somebody will visit the site and evaluate the property. After doing all that, they will also look at the possibilities of reducing the losses. So what will they say? In the policy, they will give some choices like you need to have fire extinguishers placed in every floor of your flat, right? You need to have proper mechanisms so that the electrical panel boards and all are safely protected. You need to have mechanisms wherein there is a uh, firefighting mechanism like, you know, maybe the water pipes available or maybe the sand buckets available, whatever it is. They want to ensure that these things are available so that the losses can be minimized and reduced. So they are the, they are the ways of reducing the risk. So they are trying to avoid the hazards and they may put some responsibility on you. So today when you go in some of the cabs, right, you may see the small ceasefire, you know, fire extinguishers in the cabs, right. Now because some of the uh, cab service providers and aggregators might have made it mandatory for the safety of the passenger and also the safety of the driver and the car that you need to ensure that there is a small ceasefire available with you. Now what happens with these things is the hazard can be reduced. The chances of increasing the loss can be reduced. Then let us look at what are the different types of risk management techniques. Now there's a lot of details that will come. Maybe you know it will come more details will follow with the chapters. But we thought let us cover some aspects of the insurance you know here. So when we look at risk management techniques, now some techniques which are broadly used and recommended is risk avoidance risk minimization and reduction, risk transfer and risk retention. Okay, these are the four broad categories of strategies of managing the risk. Right, now we saw what risk? Pure risk, possibility of a loss or no loss. Now, whenever there is a possibility of a loss or no loss, I can handle those risks using some of these strategies. Now, the first one is called risk avoidance. Now, what is risk avoidance? Risk avoidance is where you decide that I am not going to take the risk. Now, look at the scenarios, okay. Now, let us say, I was giving you an example of drunken driving, right. You can completely avoid the risk by not driving. 
you can take a cab you can take an auto you right you can take some of your friends help you don't drive when you are not sober when you are not in normal senses right so that is avoidance of risk the risk is an accident happening the risk is the event of death or a disability or something happening to the driving person that is a risk that's a pure risk now that risk i can avoid by having some strategies that i i have a license i have a bike i have a car but i am not going to drive or ride whenever i am not sober whenever i am not you know in complete control of senses now that is risk avoidance now we have something called risk minimization risk minimization and risk reduction is where you take the steps like i was telling you having fire extinguishers using materials which are of uh, high quality like today we talk we keep hearing across so many cases of short circuit there has been a fire in the building because of short circuit you no know, poor quality of electrical cables poor quality of the switches and other electrical equipments that is being used by enhancing the standard of these products you can ensure that you are delivering or you are having some kind of a uh, lesser risk so minimization of the losses right by going and having amcs right like your annual maintenance contracts i am having a lift i have my lift under amc now what happens the amc guys will regularly scrutinize it for operational you know defects or operational wear and tear and it is always put in a good working condition by doing this what are you doing you are trying to reduce the possibility of a failure of the lift or an accident happening right it's a loss minimization having an amc is a loss minimization right then comes risk transfer now what is risk transfer this is one of the most common methods we find and also all the risks cannot be transferred now the question is who is transferring to whom right we are you cannot transfer risk from one passenger to another passenger right you are transferring risk from one party to another party so here risk transfer is about transferring from individual to the insurance company you transfer the risk to the insurance company i am having a car i transfer the risk of accident happening to my car from me to the insurance company which is willing to insure my car when i do that the insurance company will settle the claims whenever there is an eventuality or whenever there is an event of accident that is happening now how does this insurance work we will look at a little bit more at a later point in time so this is risk transfer so that is one strategy i transfer the risk to a insurance company and the insurance company accepts that risk and when they accept the risk they are telling i will compensate you for the losses and then finally there is something called risk retention now what is risk retention risk retention is where i am retaining the risk now when i don't follow any other strategy right i am retaining the risk right i don't put a fire extinguisher i am not uh, sober i am driving you no know, very harshly i am driving you know not following the traffic rules i am retaining all the risk on me there is no way anybody else is going to compensate but can i retain all the risks no i will only retain some risks only some risks i will retain now let us look at you know risk of of having common cold right let us say we all catch cold we all have fever happening maybe you know two three times a year when the seasons are changing or when there is some infections around right now do you think some insurance company will cover you for a common cold and fever or do you think you will go to an insurance company and say uh, my friend please insure me for common cold and insure me for fever no because you retain that risk you will say boss if i have fever it is going to be a you know two three days of uh, you know discomfort i will take some medication i will visit a doctor i will take the prescription and then maybe three four days everything is going to be fine and it is not going to cost me more than few hundreds of rupees i am not going to look for insurance there i am retaining the risk there so today what are what are people doing all the small risks they are retaining right the bigger risks they want to transfer and somewhere in between they want to manage right now all these four strategies can be looked in when you look at using a car let us say you have a car and you put a seat belt now what is that it is meaning you are minimizing the loss right if there is an event happening because you are putting a seat belt the possibility that you will have you will get badly affected in an accident is much lesser right so your reduction the re reduction happens there you insure your car adequately with a car insurance company now you have transferred that risk my car is worth 10 lakh rupees i am going to insure my car for 10 lakh rupees so whenever there is an accident the seat belt will protect me 
but if there is an accident the insurance company will compensate me for the physical damages and everything to restore it back to the normal right so we are talking of risk minimization we are talking of risk transfer risk avoidance i am not going to drive in the opposite side of a one-way traffic i am not going to violate the traffic rules if there is a red i am going to respect it and stop it right i am not going to speed beyond a particular the limits whatever has been given so all this when you do that you are avoiding the chances of that risk you can avoid those risks right and then finally after doing all these things whatever is left over is the risk retention you are holding on the possibility that you may feel sleepy you may doze off behind the wheel there is a possibility but there's a risk you are retaining right you are telling that I am fine, I had a good sleep, but still there is a possibility that monotonously when you keep driving, you know, for a very long, right, you may feel fatigue and you may feel like sleeping and doze off. Now that risk is retained. You can't transfer it to an insurance company, right? You can't do anything else. You are retaining that risk. So when you look at driving a car and managing your car itself, we could see four different strategies. Now, how are these four strategies used? Now, let me just give you a small example. I want you to look at this matrix, right? So when we are talking of on X axis, we are talking of probability of event, right? That an accident we are talking of, what is the probability that event can happen? That is your X axis, okay? And we are talking of low to high. And then the intensity, intensity of loss again this is low this is high now these four techniques whatever we are seeing here we can evaluate them and choose what strategy to use according to this particular matrix or this this particular uh, uh, picture i am showing you right now let us look at what is there on high intensity in this quadrant what is there the intensity is high and the probability is also high in the quadrant X, whatever I marked here, the intensity is high, the probability is also high. Means the probability that some event can happen is very high. And whenever it happens, the intensity of the loss is also very high. Right? So currently, you know, if you see today, you know, uh, uh, there are so many people you know, who are meeting with accidents on mainly the new expressways and new highways that has opened up, right? Because the roads are very well built you know there are no speed breakers once you pay the toll and you are out of that toll you no know, you are just zooming in right now the probability that if you end up not managing your speed limits right the probability that if you are not driving within the speed limits the accident can happen is very high and whenever that happens the intensity of the loss is high your entire car is gone for a toss the driver is gone for a toss the intensity is also very high right similarly i was giving an example of people drunk and driving when somebody is drunk and driving the probability that a that an accident can happen is high and when the accident happens the intensity of the loss is also very high so what is the strategy to do here out of this four we need to avoid so wherever the probability is high and intensity is high the strategy to apply is avoid right don't travel to places you know, where there is more risk, right? Today we are talking of uh, you know, natural calamities, right? Today we are talking of wars happening at different places, right? Now imagine somebody wants to go on a <coughs> somebody wants to go on a vacation, and then he decides that I want to go on a on a vacation to some place which is having so much of risk, right? You should avoid it because by putting yourself to that kind of a uh, travel destination you are in enhancing the risk so that is easily avoidable right you should not be going to places which are not very safe right so you need to avoid it so something can be avoided then let us look at the diagonal opposite low probability and low on the intensity the possibility that something can happen is low and even if that happens the intensity of the loss is very low right retention yes so you try to retain the risk because the probability is low the, we looked at the example of a common cold and fever right if you are having some kind of a cold or fever all that you do is you will just take some medication and then you will take some rest recover and then go back to your work 
right? You retain the risk, you don't do anything else. Now, you have something here, low on the probability and high on the intensity. Low on probability, high on intensity. I want you to focus this matrix very importantly. Now, this is where the probability that an event can happen is low, but if it happens, the intensity of the loss is very high. Now, this is death by accident, premature death, falling, you know, sick with some medical calamities, right? So, all these things, the probability of something happening is low. It is not that when you go on the roads, you know, everywhere there is people dying of accidents. Do you see that? No. Accidents happen, but not that, you know, you see everywhere accidents happening, right? People do die prematurely, but it's, 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 it's of a very low probability, right? The number of people who are dying prematurely in a younger age is much, much lesser. So the probability is low. But when the person dies, when there is an event happening, the intensity of loss is very high. The family misses an individual who is potentially, you know, lot of income generating, lot of, uh, you know, value creating person to the family besides the emotional things, right? So the intensity of loss is high, right? You have a car which is worth maybe 20 lakhs. Now, the probability that your car will meet with an accident is very low. Normal cases, I am telling. Normal cases, the probability that your car will meet with an accident is very low. But if it meets with an accident, then the claims or the losses can be running into lakhs, which is huge. So, this is where we do the risk transfer. Low probability, high intensity. And believe me guys, the insurance company will also not insure you if the probabilities are high. Right? Because the insurance company is into the business of insurance. They want to make profits so that the, pro the, the premiums they are collecting is going to be uh, paying them profits after paying the claims that is made. That is the business of insurance company, right? I collect premium from so many people. I end up paying claims for few people or whatever I have anticipated. And because the claims were in, you know, in line with my anticipation, I end up making claims. I don't know, here it is working. You can just check with me. We have to be deployed. 24-7, Let's just give me a minute. I think there is some, some cross function that's happening. Yeah, now it has come. Yeah, we'll get it. Yeah, yeah it's come. Fine, guys, I think there was something else suddenly streaming. So we'll get back. So we, we are looking at risk transfer where the insurance company is trying to uh, make profits by ensuring that the claims they are paying is lesser than the premiums they are collecting. That is an objective of the insurance company. Now imagine the probability starts shooting up, right? When the probability starts shooting up, it is not favorable for an insurance company to also be in that business, right? Imagine there are 100 cars that is sold and you know 90 cars are meeting in accident. Then it doesn't make any sense for them to cover, right? Then comes the last quadrant where the probability of something happening is very high, but the intensity of loss is very low. There is a possibility that something can happen, but if that happens, the probability is very high, but whenever it happens, the losses are very low. Now, there are people, you know, who may have some kind of um, allergies, right? So, whenever there is a, uh, like, if you look at, uh, you know, people, some people may have seasonal allergies, you know, some people may have allergies to pollen, some people may have allergy to some kind of foods, right? Now, when it, this, this may be something which is of a high frequency, you know, uh, I, I have seen people who are allergic to pollen and they start uh, sneezing and they start going through breathing problems, right? And it is only when the transition of the climate happens so the transition of the weather is happening afterwards you know they end up getting back to normal and you know they don't look at spending big money on that it doesn't put them off badly for a very long period of time so the intensity is very low but the probability is high now what do you do you try to manage it right so this is where we are talking of risk management or minimization or reduction so what do you do you end up putting on masks we end up taking measures so that you don't fall into this, you avoid, you, do, you don't eat some of these things. It can be part of avoidance also, or you can be part of minimization also. You know? It's slightly narrow. 
right but if you look at the avoidance the probability is high intensity is also high here the probability is high intensity is low so you will try to manage it you know you, you will try to put a mask whenever you are going in a particular kind of a season which is not good for you or whenever you are hitting you know high pollutions you know there are cities where the pollutions are very high in particular seasons right so you try to avoid traveling those places or you put on masks right you minimize the losses by taking some uh, measures which can help you to do that so this gives us an understanding of different risk management strategies that are available right now when you look at the matrix what we showed right this matrix only spoke about the four types of strategies you can use for managing the risk but the strategy is one of the processes right but the risk management process itself will reflect something close to the first step first discussion we had today where we spoke about the six step financial planning process right we need to understand whenever the outcome needs to be streamlined and effective we need to follow some processes and here we are talking of a risk management process so which will more or less look like what we saw in the first six step process so here what we are looking at is identify the risk management goals now what does the risk management goals mean like we are talking of personal so individuals so what are the types of risks an individual is exposed to can you think of any risks an individuals is exposed to we have already discussed it right so we can talk of risks like life somebody dying premature right health somebody falling sick disability right somebody losing you know hands like physically getting disabled or challenged right or somebody may be a professional somebody may be a doctor somebody may be into a profession where there can be liability do you end up making some deficiency in your service you may be sued in the court of law for the deficiency of service so there can be liability right you are having property you are having your office you are having your house you are having your car you are having your machinery you are having your factory right so property so these are multiple things you know you can keep expanding the list it varies from individual to individual right we can talk of loss of income income loss correct so loss of job loss of income so there are so many risks which an individual is exposed to so first we need to find out what are all the risks an individual is exposed to all the individuals are not exposed to all the kinds of risks right because if you are let us say a college going student the risks you are exposed to is much lesser when compared to a person who is running a big business for a person who is running a big business the risks are much much high you know he is also responsible for the employee's welfare an employee dying in his shop floor is also a risk for the business right so we need to understand that the risks which an individual is exposed to is a function of what he is and what he is doing and where he is living and so many other things so every individual may have different risk management goals so first try to identify the list of them and then look at the information and evaluate it so what we saw in the previous slide you know probability of loss intensity of loss what are the strategies i can use can i avoid the risk how do i avoid the risk i can avoid the risk by not getting into those businesses right i have an opportunity to go and start a business in a place a and a place b place a i find is having lot of issues of theft burglary and you know safety concerns for employees so what do i do i choose a place b though it may be a little bit more expensive for me it may reduce my profitability but still i choose b because i want to reduce the i want to completely avoid the risk of my property being damaged my employees being uh, you know uh, hurt or you know having some kind of losses for them right so i can look at what kind of strategies i can look at transfer of risk insurance i will insure my plant i will insure my machinery i will insure my automobiles right i will insure my employees so risk transfer i can apply all of them right and we can also look at risk reduction i will ensure that there is proper fire fighting mechanisms i will ensure that there is proper safety protocols in my workshop i will also ensure there is proper safety gears for the client for the people who are working there for the employees right so i can do all these things which are different strategies so first i collect the data about what are the risks then i evaluate it how do i evaluate it i put it on the matrix probability and intensity and then i choose the uh, appropriate strategy for that and then i construct the strategy and implement the recommendations so when i tell you go and you do this so some of the recommendations can be implemented faster 
some of the recommendations cannot be implemented faster right so let us say buying an insurance is not an easy job right you can only go and ask a company to insure you you can't even guarantee that they will insure you right so it may take time there there is going to be an underwriting process so when they start underwriting then you will figure out that you know it's not an easy job so it may take some time and similarly you know your factory you will have some consultant who will come and say that you know you want to ensure that this prop this property is completely safe you have only one staircase right for according to fire safety maybe it is better we have one more uh, you know staircase which is not regularly used but in emergency you can use it so when you go to shopping malls and all you see right there may be a escalator there may be a lift but there will be other alternative uh, staircases available outside which is only opened up in case of emergencies because with thousands of people in the shopping mall or in a, in a in a in a multiplex right for them to come out is not easy and then you can't use lift when there is risk so you end up running on the escalators you end up running everywhere so you need more spaces now for you to build this entire setup may take time so the strategy may be there but implementing the strategy may take its own sweet time right so you should ensure that the implementation is done appropriately and then again as we saw in the previous uh, discussion monitor and review is again important like in the six step process we discussed you need to continuously monitor and review the strategies here also we need to monitor what are all the changes that is happening for the individual client right now the client started a new factory the client has started developing new products right now this is going to bring in some kind of a risk into his particular sphere of influence now that risks have to be managed now some of them like you know maybe he has wound up some businesses right so previously there was a factory where he was using it for manufacturing now that he's completely closed out that unit and now he is looking at using it for some kind of a real estate project now all the previous fire safety mechanisms and all what were there for the safety of the employees in the manufacturing unit may not be required if you are going to build a uh, building for uh, residential accommodation or something it may be a different set of things so you need to monitor and review the requirement of the client continuously the client may be a individual when he took a policy maybe he is a software employee working with a you know big it gen and he is only 23 24 years old so you do a financial plan you advise him to buy some kind of an insurance and then he gets later married so you need to ensure that his spouse is also insured and maybe later they will have some assets he will have a house he will have a car he will have children so you need to ensure that as the situation around him is changing the risks which he is exposed to also keeps changing and as the risks are changing you need to continuously review and appropriately come up with strategies that can be handling them right so this is your risk management process now when we spoke about risk management process we also said that risk transfer is one of the important aspects when there is in the risk transfer what is happening you are transferring the risk from yourself to the company right now will the company blindly accept any kind of a risk now if they are blindly accepting all kinds of risks believe me the insurance company is going to wind up sooner than later right they need to evaluate the risk and they should understand that i am giving proper risk coverages for right people right now that is where the underwriting comes in now what is underwriting now underwriting is a process wherein they evaluate the risk whether i can take this risk because you are transferring it to the company the company is evaluating can i take this risk or not and if i am taking it what is the right price i should charge because all the risks are not priced uniform right if you are going for insuring a car which is worth 10 lakh rupees the underwriting look is different when you are trying to go and insure a car which is a sports car it is going to be different and if you are a guy who is a racing guy then the risk is underwritten in a different way if you are going to use your car for normal city purposes your risk is written in a different way so we need to understand the underwriting people will evaluate the exposure of the risk and how it is going to be you no know, costing the company and they price the risk appropriately now this process is called underwriting now you can see i just read it out for you the process of underwriting then determines whether a risk is reasonable to accept should i accept it or not if it is not acceptable i will say i am sorry i would not take it nobody can force me to take any risk right so i can say i will not and if at what price if i decide to take it then what is the price i have to charge this guy right 
and with what conditions you remember i was telling you about some conditions few minutes back you know you have to put the fire extinguishers you need to have you no know, proper uh, you know escape routes and all right so they will put the conditions also they are not going to insure you prior blindly they are going to insure you with a price and with conditions so what kind of conditions i should put right applications for insurance coverage are sent to the insurer for underwriting so you go and apply to the insurance company then that company will have a department called underwriting department now these people will evaluate it now when they are evaluating it they may ask you for more information as they start looking at things they will ask you for more information right let us say you are telling i am i am into the business of transporting goods now they may ask you you know what kind of goods do you transport now if you are telling i am going to transport inflammable substances then the risk is different if you are telling that i am into transporting uh, vegetables the risk is different do you think it is going to be treated in the same way by the insurance company no one is inflammables more risky physical hazard right the other one is vegetables so there is no big risk by carrying any vegetables per se right so we need to understand they evaluate these parameters and upon acceptance of the risk the insurer issues a policy and completes the underwriting process the underwriting process is completed when they determine a premium which they will charge you and then they make an offer to you okay i will take this risk you pay me this much every year once you pay the premium then they are willing to take the risk so underwriting is this entire process now let us look at you know how underwriting works in case of life insurance just to give an example because you know all of us can relate to it let us say that there is a uh, there is a doctor who is going and asking an insurance company for life insurance now there is no uh, job related risk for a doctor right so he is going to be sitting in his uh, you know consulting uh, hospital or if he is a surgeon maybe he is uh, in his you know ot and doing his job so there is no uh, occupational hazard for him so he will be treated with a normal kind of a risk but imagine at the on the same day there is another person who is going and applying for an insurance and his job is working in some mines or his job is in digging tunnels or his job is something of a different level of risk now you think the insurance company is going to put both of them in the same you know risk no both of them may be of same age group the doctor is also 35 year old this guy is also 35 year old but this fellow's profession and this fellow's profession are different now that is called the occupational hazard so we discussed about hazard hazard is where the possibility that an event can happen or the loss can be high now the same age person same both are healthy now everything is fine but his occupation builds a hazard that the probability that something can go wrong is high for him so i have to underwrite his risk separately now you know what the moment they see this uh, proposal form they will ask the person can you give more details about your job so they will have a questionnaire which is an occupational questionnaire so they will give that questionnaire and ask the person please fill this and give me so in that they will have multiple types of questions you know what kind of exposure he has you know is he exposed to blasts in the mines you know what kind of job now if he is telling no no i am with the tunnel department but i don't go to the site i am only a designer now his risk is lesser no he is just going to sit in a ac office or somewhere you know in the back end and he is designing how the tunnel needs to be designed he is not on the ground so though he is in the same profile in, in the same business his job profile is slightly different so when you collect the occupational questionnaire you will know what are the real hazards he is exposed to and then the company will decide whether i am going to insure this guy or not now this is what is underwriting now i was also telling that the insurance company may not be accepting all the risks but leaving aside whether they will accept the risk or not we need to understand can all the risks be insured i also said in the beginning part of the discussion all risks cannot be insured there are some categories of risks which can be insured now for those risks to be insured they are called insurable risks and then you can see different requirements for a risk to be insured there are different criteria which satisfies the condition for insurance to be uh, available for that risk now remember insurance is a risk transfer mechanism you are transferring the risk to the insurance company now insurance company is in the business of taking the risk and managing the entire business and making profits for the shareholders so that is the job of the insurance company right now in the process 
we need to ensure that the businesses which are taking risk will take risks only if they satisfy some conditions. What are the conditions? The law of large numbers must apply. Now, if you if you are telling I want to have this risk insured, there should be adequate number of people with a similar kind of a risk. The law of large numbers. Right? So, when you are looking at getting an insurance coverage, you should ensure that this number exists. Now, let me explain a small scenario. Okay, let us say this entire insurance as a concept generated, you know, few centuries back when people used to uh, carry the goods for business on the ships, right? So, let us say that, you know, you people were traveling from, you know, point A to point B, right? I will, I will try to take a simple example and let us say that there were 100 ships which were loaded with the goods necessary and each ship is worth 1 lakh rupees. Each ship is worth 1 lakh rupees of goods. Okay. Now of the 100 ships that are leaving the shore A, only 99 ships ends up reaching the shore B. Now this is what the figure do. That every day 100 ships leave the shore A, but when they reach the destination, only 99 are reaching. One ship is not reaching. Okay. Now they decided that, okay, fine. We don't know which one will be the one you know, that is lost. Now, because of that, because they are business minded, they decided let us all manage the risk. So, what they started doing is before leaving the shore A, they started collecting 1000 rupees from each of them. So, all the 100 ships guys will put 1000 rupees into a, you know, a box. Now, it becomes 1 lakh. Now, at the end of the journey, one ship is gone. So, for that fellow, this 1 lakh compensation is given. Now, this is how the basic rudimentary insurance concept started happening. Now, let us see the law of large numbers. Let us apply the law of large numbers here. Let us say that instead of 100 ships, there are 1000 ships and one ship is getting destroyed. So, your 1000 rupees would have become 100 rupees. So, each person will have to pay only 100 rupees. Right? And let us say it became 10,000. That there are 10,000 ships and let us say the two ships are getting destroyed. Okay, two are getting destroyed. So, which basically means two lakhs. So, still you will end up paying only 20 rupees per person. Right? Because when the law of large number starts coming in, the probabilities will be very favorable for us. Now, we all st studied probabilities at some point in time, right? So, when you talk of tossing a coin, right? The probability is a 50-50. Wherein you toss a coin, 50% chances it is a heads, 50% chance it is a tail. That does not mean that the first time I toss it is head, second time it will be tail, right? It doesn't mean that. Because, you know, probability is not telling you that if you toss two times, once it will be head, once it will be tails. What probability says is when you repeat that event for more and larger number of times, it will start coming closer to 50-50. That's what the probability means. Now, for that 50-50 probability to manifest, the event should happen more number of times larger number of times. You keep tossing the coin 1 million times. Then heads and tails will come closer to 5 lakh each. Closer. Maybe 5 lakh plus and you know 4 lakh 99,000 and odd. Something like that. It will come closer to that. Now that's what the probability is. So for the probability to be realistic, you need to have large number of uh, population or large number of iterations to be made. So here, when you look at 10,000, it comes down to 20 rupees. Two ships, 10,000, 20 rupees, 2 lakhs, right? So, people will just pay it off. Now, if you look at how when you book a ticket for a train, like on an IRCTC website or anywhere, there is a checkbox given, you know, to, uh, insure yourself for accidental insurance, right? They charge you hardly anything. It is hardly 1 or 2 rupees, right? Now, how are they insuring you for less than a rupee and 2 rupees? Because the number of people who are using the trains on a daily basis is in millions. And not that every day there is an accident happening and not that every day people are dying, right? So, when there are millions of people, they are collecting 1 rupee, 2 rupee from everybody who is booking a ticket. And the claim will happen only when there is an event happening. So, the law of large numbers, the larger the number of people, the probabilities are better reflected and the loss management and the loss compensation becomes easier. So, when I am looking at insurable risk, I should ensure that it is a law of large numbers. It should be large number of people who are having a similar kind of a risk. Now, there can be exceptions. We need to understand everything comes with exceptions, right? Now, what are the exceptions? 
Now, let us say somebody is having, uh, somebody is a sportsman, right? So, somebody is a football player. Now, the football player says, I want to go and insure my legs. Now, there have been cases where, you know, people have insured different parts of their body. Now, a football player, you now you can't go and say that, you know, you go and get one lakh people like you. Only then, you know, I will look at insuring because I want large number of people. We can't say that. So there, there are specific types of pricing, you know, which we will look in detail at a later point of time, where different concepts are applied. So in rare cases, there are exceptions where you insure them irrespective of being a single scenario case. But underwriting will be done and the underwriting done there is different. It is not on probabilities. It is not on you know, predicting the losses. It is on various other factors, right? So IPL is going to start maybe in some weeks. Now, so the matches are being insured. If there, if there is any reason the match doesn't happen or there is something happening, you know, there is a losses for the organizers, the losses are going to be compensated. Now, we need to understand some of these things will not fit into the law of large numbers, but they are exceptions. They are underwritten in a different way. Right? The loss must be by chance, means the losses should not be intentional. It should be accidental, right? Insurable risk, large number is one of the aspects. Second thing is the losses should be accidental. Right? Accidental does not mean accident. Accidental means which is not planned. The losses should be not planned. Now you cannot buy an insurance and then you cannot uh, plan a damage to your warehouse and make the claims. Now that is not accidental. Right? That is intentional. Now, if it is not accidental, if it is intentional, the insurance company can even refute the claims. They can say, I will not pay you because it looks fishy. Right? So, the losses should be accidental. Why the losses should be accidental? The loss should be accidental because only then the probability will work. Right? Imagine the coin I am tossing is a fair coin. Right? It should be a fair coin. I don't know how many of you saw the movie Shole. In that, in the end, you know, you will see that the coin which was used but Amitabh Bachchan always had only, you know, heads, he didn't have tails. So always there was heads and always he used to win. That is not a fair coin, right? Now, even things are supposed to be accidental, it is fair. The probability of the losses are supposed to be in line with it. But if the if, if it is not accidental, then the probabilities will not work. Let us say out of a thousand people applying for insurance, right, for a particular kind of an insurance, let us say people have an, in, you know, hidden agenda to intentionally cause losses then the probabilities will not work normally. It will be very much deviating from what you expected. So, the losses should be accidental. It cannot be intentional. The losses must be measurable and be defined. Again, we need to understand that in insurance, the losses have to be compensated. And when the losses have to be compensated, what is the amount of compensation to be paid? There should be a number, right? So, let us say that you are having a watch which your grandfather gifted it to you. Now, that would be maybe 100 years old or 80 years old. Okay. Now, because it is your grandfather's gift, it may be of intense value to you. But you cannot go to an insurance company and say, I want to insure this watch and you know it is very highly valuable. I can't just put a price to it. Then the insurance company will say, I can't do that. Let us agree on some price. Right? Now, this is a particular model watch or maybe your grandfather bought it in some auction. Then the value is going to be different. So, we will have to agree on some kind of a value. Because if we don't agree on the value, I can't compensate you for the losses, right? So the losses should be measurable and clearly defined. When you are taking the risk, you should tell him that this is the damage, this is the losses, I will pay you so much, right? The losses must not be financially catastrophic. Now, this is again important because you need to understand that when you look at the losses, the losses here cannot be catastrophic. When you say catastrophic, what does it mean? A huge wave of losses. So we are talking of the half the city getting flooded. Now, if that is the kind of a losses happening, the insurance company also cannot settle the claims, right? So some of them are called acts of God, right? Where there is no way people can uh, uh, manage those kind of losses because the insurance company also has a particular way of operating and it cannot pay off all the losses. Right? So catastrophic basically means uh, of huge magnified uh, losses. Intensity, intensity will be more. Intensity is more. And for a more number of people. Like let us say there is a flood is happening. Right? 
and then the floods have uh, damaged let us say 30 percent of the houses or 25 percent of the houses right if, if it is catastrophic if there is a normal flood it is not causing catastrophic losses it is fine but it is causing catastrophic losses it is very huge yeah more intensity of losses because even the insurance company needs to pay right now there is a they have expected that this is the kind of losses if it is going to be catastrophic then their business model will not work so they are telling it should not be catastrophic financially right yeah i think with this we will stop i think we are almost you know close to 355 so what i will do is i'll quickly try to recap what we have done till now so that you know you can get a you know uh, understanding of all the things in proper context right now, first we started looking at uh, why financial planning, what is the need for financial planning, the changing context of financial planning, because people are working in private companies, people are having uncertain jobs and incomes, they need to plan their finances. We also discussed that it is more about personal financial planning, it is has nothing to do with corporate finance, so you need to relate to that. And then when we looked at financial planning, we saw that to do a proper planning, there needs to be a process and then there is a six step financial planning process which is prescribed by FPSB. Now in that we saw the step one is about establishing the relationship, step two is about collecting the data right? and step three is about analyzing the data, step four is about giving appropriate recommendations and presenting the financial plan, step five is about implementing the plan and step six is about monitoring and reviewing and we saw in detail about why all these steps are relevant and important in each of these places. right? And then after that, we started looking at what are all the various aspects that needs to be looked in the financial planning. So we saw risk management, estate planning, investment planning, retirement planning and tax planning. Now these are five functional areas which you have to be very clear when you are looking at financial plan. Now you cannot only do one part of it and say it is a financial plan. No, it is not. If you do only retirement plan, it is not a financial plan. Right? So all this put together comes a financial plan. Now I try to bring in after that in context that this entire financial planning uh, profession right, is, uh, uh, is covering these aspects and these aspects are given in form of uh, syllabus and certifications by FPSB. So when we saw the three certifications wherein it's about investment planning specialist and uh, risk and estate planning and uh, retirement and tax planning specialist. So these are the three certifications which are available. And after you clear these three, you can write the final module, which is a uh, financial integrated financial planning. So, which is the consolidated financial plan, right? So, wherein all the concepts you learned will be put to test, right? Now, all the subjects what we cover in this particular context will be facilitating you to build that financial plan by the end of the curriculum, right? So, each of these modules will deal with that, and at the end of it, all of them will come together like a jigsaw puzzle, and they will make the entire financial plan as a uh, overall structure for you for delivering it to the clients right and then we started looking at risk management right uh, today we thought we will cover some aspect as an introduction to the risk management so we saw pure risk and speculative risk so we saw that speculative risk has a possibility of a gain whereas a pure risk has no possibility of a gain it's only a loss or a no loss proposition and uh, we also looked at some examples like you know life insurance right? person is either alive or dead health insurance, a person is either healthy or not, you know, or sick, there is no third combination. There is a vehicle which is running fine or you know, met with an accident and there is some problem happening to it. So it's a zero or one, you know, uh, there is no possibility of a gains coming there. So for a risk to be insured, we all have to have a pure risk or these are the risks which we need to uh, handle with uh, uh, the risk management process. And then we saw that there are different strategies like risk avoidance, risk management or risk minimization and risk transfer and risk retention. And when we looked at these strategies, we also looked at the X, Y axis of probability of loss and intensity of loss, when we saw high probability, high intensity avoid, low probability, low intensity retain, and then uh, low probability, high intensity transfer and the last one where you are risk minimization or managing yourself, right? Try to take measures which can control or manage the risk. And then we also looked at the risk management process and in the risk management process we saw that like the six step process of financial planning you have six steps wherein you try to identify the risks, evaluate the risks, appropriate strategies have to be found and then make appropriate strategies implemented and then you monitor and review them. Right? 
and then finally we ended up coming to the different types of uh, requirements of the insurable risk and wherein we saw that it used to be a large number of uh, exposure units homogeneous large number of units it also should be accidental losses the losses should be definite and measurable you should be in a position to define exactly what is the kind of a loss and what is the compensation is going to be and more importantly the losses cannot be financially catastrophic if, if they are going to be financially catastrophic the insurance companies cannot settle the claims right so fine guys i think with this we will come to the end of the session i don't know no i can't see any queries here so you have any queries uh, no, whatever your questions is you can just uh, raise it no maybe you know we will take it two three minutes and then we will pause what, it. Is, the what is the depth of the course timeline, timeline. CA means like Five years, four years. Time frame you are telling. See the time frame of the course for someone who is very uh, very focused, right? So they can look at maybe you know twelve to eighteen months. One year. Yeah, one year is very neck to neck. Okay. So because you need to clear four papers, correct? So one year would be neck to neck. If you are very serious and very particular, you can finish it comfortably within uh, you know somewhere between twelve to eighteen. One and a half years. Comfortably, you can do that. Yeah. Sir, costs. Costs, I would say, you know, check up with RV Pro. Okay, because the costs have different functionalities and different variants. Okay, so I don't want to get to the cost. I would like to know anything with respect to the curriculum and course. You can ask me. What's the qualification? Qualification also plus two, plus two, tenth. I mean, plus two pass is the primary qualification. But by the time you clear all the modules. See, there are two things. One is pursuing the qualification. Second is getting the qualification. Exams you can complete, but when they are giving you the certification, right, you need to have completed your graduation. Yeah, to register, you can start after plus two. But by the time you finish your exams and to get the CFP as a uh, uh, certificate for you, right, you should have passed and there is a experience criteria. There are various other factors. Minimum graduation and there is some experience criteria also. You will be completing the exam part through this. So there are other aspects also which you need to look at. Placement and the practice like CFR. See now practice again uh, the job opportunities if you are looking at it. Uh, there are a lot of job opportunities in the VFSA sector. Banking, financial services and uh, you know insurance and yeah, investments. Private companies, private companies you know there are opportunities. Okay. Uh, in relationship managers, wealth management companies, right? Investment advisory companies. You know, there are opportunities there. Now, again, you said, can I practice? Yes. Now, if you want to practice, then there are different uh, ways of looking at it. Okay, because uh, if you are practicing as a financial planner, you should register with SEBI and get a license. Sir, future like I thought of after completing this may. I want to join any other stock market business like NS, NSM certification, sorry, research service. Yeah, any other questions? This we will take it off offline. Any other questions which maybe others can. Can I work with foreign agencies? Is there any chance of after doing this course? Can I go and like work in a foreign countries? After a year? See, the, this certification CFP is accepted in more than 26, 27 countries, if I'm right, and somewhere around 26, 27 countries. Now that uh, that gives you an opportunity if you are looking at going to other countries and looking for professionals, it is possible. But there should be one more paper you need to clear. You know, like FPSB in India, right? There are bodies there which are giving CFP certification there. Like this, uh, I have completed this four modules. Sir. No. After that, I have to give another five modules. No, only one module. One one or two modules will be there, which is resp with respect to that country. So that varies from country to country. So wherever you are trying to go for, you need to check with the FPSB with respective countries and then see what are the modalities. The possibility is there, modalities will vary. So you need to figure out on that. Yes. Fine guys, so uh, we will stop the session here and uh, we will look forward for further sessions. Thank you.